Scotland with Rebecca and Martin. It's Monday evening. Welcome to The Nine. Tonight, the sudden collapse of the once mighty Thomas Cook. The huge effort to get people home is underway. The travel agents stopped trading early this morning, leaving holidaymakers stranded and jobs at risk all around the world. Well, Thomas Cook, we're still sending us emails to tell us to check in. They were telling us our flight was still on. So no one has phoned us, no one has emailed us. We've had to find out just when we've arrived. Also tonight, strong words for world leaders as Greta Thunberg appears at the UN. And here is the moment and the reaction as she sets eyes for the first time on President Trump. And we'll be in the States tonight looking at the key issues ahead of the 2020 presidential election. Tonight, coal versus climate change in West Virginia. Also from Sri Lanka, a story of how nearly 100,000 lives were saved simply by banning lethal pesticides. If I was to drink this now, I would quite quickly fall to the floor unconscious. I'd have fluid pouring out of my mouth, out of my, uh, I'd be covered in sweat. If I'm unfortunate, I would then have stopped breathing. From Japan, the Scottish rugby squad searches for answers after that dismal opening defeat to Ireland. Already one man down due to injury, a disheartened squad moved to their second destination today, ahead of next week's game against Samoa. Good evening, welcome to The Nine. Today, after lengthy speculation and more than 170 years in business, the travel agent Thomas Cook collapsed completely. It left 600,000 holidaymakers stranded abroad. That includes 150,000 British customers. Underway now, a massive operation to get all these people home. The UK government says it's the largest repatriation of its kind since the Second World War. 45 planes have been chartered for the task. It even has a code name, Operation Matterhorn. The price? An estimated £600 million. But as we'll soon see, the cost of the collapse is more than just financial. Today we've been hearing countless stories of passengers stranded, family holidays ruined, overseas weddings thrown into chaos. There's also the impact on Thomas Cook's employees, of course, with 20,000 jobs at risk worldwide, 9,000 of them in the UK. In a moment we'll be discussing what caused such a huge institution to fail. But first, Carol Erskine has the latest on the day's events. The final Thomas Cook flight landing back on UK soil. The passengers on this plane, the lucky ones who managed to make it home, but looked after by staff who knew they no longer had a job. As soon as we landed, oh, they were all crying. It's, it's devastating. It's just, it's a, it's a legacy. It's gone, as I say, I worked for, ten, I worked for them for 10 years and I've got lo loads of friends who, the livelihood, it's... It's tragic. A bit emotional, very emotional. The cabin crew all crying, uh, a bit sombre, to be honest. It's for a company that big and to be, to be going that long to go under, I think it's a bit devastating. The collapse of Britain's oldest package tour company has left 150,000 British tourists stranded. A massive repatriation effort is now underway, but Thomas Cook's own planes cannot help. They've been impounded at airports across the country as the firm failed to find the extra funding it needed to stay afloat. I would like to say sorry to all our customers, those who are on holiday with us now, and those who have booked with us in the coming months. It is deeply distressing to me that it has not been possible to save one of the most loved brands in travel. Thank you. Some 16,000 holidaymakers were booked to fly home today. Staff from the Civil Aviation Authority are helping those customers stuck abroad, with the CAA chartering 45 planes to return them to the UK, but not necessarily to the airport they expected. 
Instead of direct to Glasgow, we're going to Birmingham, then they're, they're busing us to Birmingham to Glasgow, so that's as far as we know, but things could change. I'm very anxious because I have a sore leg, so I don't know how, if I'm going to go on a plane and then how I'm going to get from Glasgow, if they take us to Birmingham or somewhere else, um, so it's going to be very difficult. All Thomas Cook holidays are now cancelled and customers will need to seek compensation from the government's at-all scheme or from their credit card or insurance companies. Around a million customers had travel bookings for the coming months. For Joe and Sally Dottoli from Florida, a week's holiday in Scotland has come to an expensive end when their flight from Glasgow was cancelled this morning. It's just frustrating because we've already spent money on the return flight and now we've had to book another ticket. I mean, it was uh, 2,200 US dollars, so 1,700 pounds, somewhere in there. They are saying two weeks to get refunds, but they should have covered the people that were flying within the next few days and made sure that they got out. It wasn't right that they just shut down and stopped. Today also brought the end of Thomas Cook on the high street. More than 500 shops across the UK closed. How are you all feeling? These staff in Nottingham came in to hear the bad news before the door was locked behind them for good. The effort to return all holidaymakers to the UK is expected to take two weeks, but questions are growing about why this pioneer of travel was left to collapse while the taxpayer will pick up the bill for bringing everyone home. Carol Erskine, BBC News. Well, we're joined now by Alan Glenn of Glenn Travel, who's also the previous president of the Scottish Passengers Agents Association. Uh, Alan, were you surprised at today's news? Uh, it was a big shock, I suppose, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there had been talk of the failure, but everyone thought that we're going to meet their deadlines and, and it wouldn't happen. Uh, Thomas Cook, the history is fascinating. It goes back almost 170 years. As a company, they've survived the economic storms that have blown through in that time. They've survived yes. a couple of world wars, but they yeah. can't survive the advance of the internet. Is that, is that what's done for it, do you think? It wasn't entirely the, the advance of the internet. Uh, they saddled themselves with a lot of debt and did a merger with my travel in 2007. And, uh, you know, part of the thing that led to the failure was that they, they had a 1.5 billion loss reported in May and a billion pounds of that was due to the write-off of the My Travel merger which obviously was a, a huge failure in terms of business and uh, that had then they had to start refinancing from that point. Uh, so in your opinion was it a management failing then rather than the industry or the you know the, the, the environment you know, industrial environment? Yes yeah, so I would say very much so you know uh, it's not just the, the internet that's caused this failure and uh, uh, you know, the internet's an opportunity for travel agents as well. Uh, people sell on, on the internet and are doing very well on that. But uh, I think they just had some challenges with some of the business decisions that were made uh, and, and the business, the merger with My Travel, the, the takeover of co op travel later on proved to be a, a, a big mistake as well. So, I mean, instinctively, I'm inclined to think of, of travel agents these days as, as struggling because people are inclined to book their own travel, do it independently. All these, you know, bargain airlines, budget airlines coming on stream. It's never been easier with Airbnb, with all these kind of Skyscanner, all these things that are so easy. How, how is business? Business is good. I mean, uh, I think, you, as I said, um, the Internet's an opportunity. And if you're, if you're trading as a travel agent, you can uh, you can advertise your wares there, and you know, travel agents like myself are very good at tailor making holidays. We've got our own atoll license, and uh, you know you can you can package. We can package in the same way that you can on internet, except we can provide the atoll uh, cover the atoll coverage and protection that isn't available on, on the internet. And that's the one thing that if there's no one else in this situation, but I would say that the the UK has a very good protection system for package holidays called the Atoll system and that's been shown to kick in at this point and people will get their money back. And we, we always hear in these situations about the people who are stra uh, stranded or stuck for a few days or a week or whatever in, in, in foreign airports but yes. I guess it's important to remember tonight that the real impact of this is going to be borne by the by the staff who are out of jobs now. Absolutely, that's, there's, a, there's a, a terrible human tragedy happening here. Uh, uh, and I mean, you're talking about 9,000 people in the UK out of a job. They'll be in the high hundreds in, in Scotland, uh, 60 store closures in the high street in Scotland. And, and those people had worked in Thomas Cook for, for many, many years, a lot of them very skilled people. And they wake up this morning without a job. 
you know, and it's, there is that human tragedy taking place today. And very briefly, if you can, do you think the industry is going to find space for them? I mean, these, these people are going to have to look elsewhere now? They'll look elsewhere. There are, there are opportunities, uh, you know, some of them might set up uh, business on their own or become home workers or, or there's, there's various are, are feed into the wider travel network. You know, I, I think there definitely are opportunities there. All right, Alan Glenn, thank you very much indeed for being with us this evening. Yeah, thank you're you. welcome. Now, after a lively debate at the Labour conference in Brighton, the party leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has won the support of members in a crucial vote. That is, the party will stay neutral on whether to leave or remain in the EU while a future Labour government tries to negotiate a new deal. The conference voted against a motion which would have committed Labour to campaign to remain in any future referendum. Our Westminster correspondent, Rajdeep Sandhu, is in Brighton. Following the Labour leader around everywhere he goes are questions about Labour's Brexit policy. You still plan to stay neutral, Mr. Carbon? Does it want to remain or leave the EU? We're doing stall visits at the moment, and I think you're shouting, are you confident quest the party you're will shouting back on questions at people. It's quite rude, actually. Does anybody know? This conference has once rude, again actually. turned into a battleground over Brexit. The Scottish Labour Party has already made up its mind. It's loud and proud for Remain. There needs to be clarity uh, and that uh, if the Labour Party isn't clear about what its preferred option is, then there is a danger that we'll be marginalised by other parties. So we want a clear position. Many Labour members from across the UK would agree. I believe that we should become the voice of Remain. I think we, should, we need to be, we'll have an unequivocal um, policy from this conference going forward to let the country know and the public know that we're on the side of Remain and that we need to be the voice of that in a coming election. So that's what Yeah, and I absolutely agree. We need to be the voice of Remain and we need to be a Remain party and we need to be unashamedly Remain. Yes, we should offer another referendum given that there's so much more information now um, and people should have the chance to have their say again but we very much want Labour to campaign for Remain. If you want a referendum, vote Labour. Even senior members of Labour want the party to be in favour of Remain. Conference, you know where I stand on the question of Remain. I've said many times that I will campaign for Remain. The debate on Brexit that followed was fierce and the vote turned into a test of loyalty to the leader. We stand behind Jeremy Corbyn. Okay, we need to support him, we need to trust him and his team. Back your leader. Support Jeremy. Those who voted leave and those who voted remain have intersecting struggles, hopes and dreams. And voting today to unequivocally back a remain position abdicates our duty to respect the voices of everyone, no matter how they voted. I know young people will hold their vote against us unless we'll tell them we'll campaign to remain. Conference, we are not going to get Jeremy Corbyn into number 10 if we continue to have this fudged Brexit policy. The vote happened with a show of hands, and it means the party would hold a second referendum, okay, giving a choice really between carried. a Brexit deal or Remain. But now we'll decide later which option it would back, its own deal, or to stay in the EU. But there was anger and calls for a more accurate vote. In the end, it was a victory for Jeremy Corbyn. But it's a big loss for those Labour members that wanted the party to become one for Remain without any ifs or buts or questions. But that's not happening here. And it's left a bitter taste for some. Disappointed. Uh, you know, I respect uh, the, the vote if, if we knew actually what the vote was. But the point I'm making is that I think it was undemocratic. Others were delighted. I felt the vote went really well. I think it showed the sort of support that we have now for Jeremy Corbyn within the party. The question of whether Labour is a party that wants to stay or leave the EU hasn't been answered. They've left that argument to fester for another time. Rajdeep Sandhu, BBC News, Brighton. It is Monday night and you're watching The Nine. A reminder of tonight's main story. A massive repatriation effort gets underway after the holiday company Thomas Cook collapses. And still to come before 10. Sri Lanka had one of the highest rates of suicide in the world, but since the country banned several types of pesticides, suicides have fallen by 75%. We hear from the Edinburgh academic investigating the issue. 
And we take a look at the first of three brand new charging hubs for electric cars in Dundee. Remember, you can watch the best of the nine's journalism on our website, including the first in our series of reports from the US ahead of the presidential race. Our chief news correspondent, James Cook, has been looking at the impact of climate change on the key Rust Belt state of West Virginia. The address you need is bbc.co.uk forward slash the nine. And you can also connect with us on social media. We are at BBC Scott nine on Instagram and Twitter. And our hashtag is hashtag the nine. And what you probably won't want to catch up with on the internet is uh, Scotland's performance <laughs> against Ireland oh, at the weekend, will you, Amy? Martin, I'm so glad you said that. It was just, it really was not what Gregor Townsend and his squad, or the whole of Scotland for that matter, would, would have hoped for after what's felt like months of talk, of preparations. They were together as a squad for 100 days. So they've had plenty of time to prepare and really get to know each other as a squad if they didn't already. And yeah, 27-3 battering by Ireland. I don't think anybody would disagree. Scotland just never looked like they were getting in the game. Ireland got two tries within the first 15 minutes. So it was really, really difficult. So I think for all the squad now, they don't play Samoa until a week today. So they've got a long time to assess, to analyse what did go wrong. And I think just try and go into this next game with any lessons they can really take from, yeah. from that initial game, which will be a complete knock to their confidence. So uh, Stuart McAnally, the captain, was speaking at a press conference and he said exactly that. This is time to look at what went wrong and try not let it affect the rest of the campaign. So fingers crossed. Text it was Week hopefully just a, just a dodgy start, perhaps. Text Let's Week put it Scotland. down to that. It's the hope like that kills you. It is, isn't it? But we've, we've still got the rest of the, the campaign left. So fingers crossed. Fingers it's crossed. onwards and upwards for here, from here. Fingers <laughs> crossed indeed. Right, we'll see you in a bit. See Cheers, you soon, Amy. guys. Now, it's thought Sri Lanka had one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Over the past 20 years, an average of 6,000 people have taken their own lives each year. That's a similar number to the UK, but Sri Lanka has a population less than a third of the size of ours. But recently, several toxic pesticides have been banned, and the number of suicides has fallen by a remarkable 75%. The moves thought to have saved almost 100,000 lives. One Edinburgh University academic has dedicated his career to investigating the rate of poisonings and he's working with the World Health Organisation to bring about a ban of the most dangerous pesticides in poorer countries. The BBC's correspondent Matthew Hill has this report from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a country with a growing population, but with more mouths to feed, it has to rely more and more heavily on growing its own crops. Agriculture is the biggest sector employs over one in four people here. I've come to its rural heartland in the very centre of the country. Smallholders around Anuradhapura have little land, so they rely on pesticides to maintain crop yields. But with high levels of poverty, this community has suffered an epidemic of suicide through drinking pesticide. In 1990, the vast majority of pesticide sales globally were to high-income countries like the USA. But over the decades, that shifted to lower and middle-income countries. And with that shift has come a rise in the death toll from pesticide poisonings. For just a few dollars, it's easy to buy potentially lethal products. It really is quite toxic in itself. If I was to drink this now, I would quite quickly fall to the floor unconscious. I'd have fluid pouring out of my mouth, out of my, uh, I'd be covered in sweat. If I'm unfortunate, I would then have stopped breathing. If that happens before I get to hospital, then all the problems of that is I might get brain damage, I might aspirate the fluid into my lungs and I get pneumonia if I survive the hospital. Other patients just simply don't survive at all. And it's from this shop where a smallholder bought pesticide four months ago that killed 15-year-old Prometha. His father forgot to lock it up. Prometha drank it after a row with his mother. He came to me and said, I'm sorry, Mum, and sat on the doorstep. I touched his head and face and asked him, Son, why are you sad like that? He didn't say anything. I rushed him to the hospital. Doctors came and started to treat him. Soon he passed away. He, he managed to give himself a pneumonia. 
Dr. Michael Edelston has been studying pesticide poisoning here for a quarter of a century. When he started in the 1990s, this hospital was full of patients who drunk pesticides. But after a successful campaign to ban the most harmful chemicals, it's led to the biggest fall in suicides anywhere in the world. So today, there's only one victim, a 19-year-old who drank herbicide after a family dispute. When I started my career, in, that was in 1999, it was so common. Uh, and I have seen slow, very slow deaths occurring. There was a young boy who is actually about 20, in his 20s, and I can still remember his uh, departing words. This wouldn't have happened if I have not taken this uh, in that momentum. It was a sort of a... Uh, very sudden decision. He wanted to just scare his parents. There was, an heated, there was a heated argument. So that was traumatic for me. Since the ban came in on the most harmful pesticides here in Sri Lanka, research has shown that from 1995 to 2015, there was an overall reduction in suicides of 75%. That's around 93,000 lives saved. This group of experts from the World Health Organization have just concluded that low to low middle income countries like Nigeria or India should also ban the most dangerous pesticides. It predicts that for less than 10 cents per person per year, this approach will save as many as, for instance, 26,000 lives in India alone each year. So since the Green Revolution in the 1960s with the introduction of pesticides, we estimate that around 10 million people have taken their lives from pesticide self-poisoning. In our most recent study, we estimated that pesticide self-poisoning can account for up to one in five of the world's suicides. That's over 100,000 deaths a year. It would take a relatively simple measure, banning the most highly toxic products that have long since been banned in the West to prevent tens of thousands of deaths every year. One of the world's largest pesticide producers disagrees. It prefers to give farmers boxes where they can lock up their pesticides safely. We believe that the issue of intentional misuse or suicide is a very, very complex one. And you can't just solve it by taking one means away from the market. You need to look at it from a societal, from an economic, and also from an environmental perspective. But Professor Edelston and colleagues have done the biggest study of 186 villages in Sri Lanka and found that boxes are left open. If we give a box into your household and not into yours, not into someone else's, will that reduce the number of people who drink pesticides? We've shown very, very clearly in this huge study there was no effect at all. That really, by providing better storage in a house, did not prevent people from taking it in self-harm. This family's story shows that banning the most harmful pesticides will not prevent all tragic deaths, but it does reduce the death toll. After a consultation period, it's expected member states of the WHO will be asked to approve their recommendation that it's highly cost-effective to ban the most harmful pesticides next year. Experts feel it could save tens of thousands of lives. Matthew Hill, BBC News. Sally Challen, who served almost nine years in jail for killing her abusive husband, has told the BBC's Victoria Derbyshire programme she's sorry she killed him. Sally was freed from prison when her murder charge was reduced to manslaughter with diminished responsibility following an appeal. She says she's speaking out to warn others about the dangers of coercive control. I loved Richard and I wanted to be with him. Um, and I killed the man I loved. Did he deserve to die? No. And I'm very sorry for what happened. Um, I should have been a stronger person. I should have left him earlier. Um, but I just couldn't. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex are in South Africa with their baby son Archie for their first official tour as a family. On their first stop of the 10-day tour, Meghan praised a centre in the township Nianga in Cape Town that supports children and female empowerment. In the coming days, Prince Harry is due to travel alone to Botswana, Malawi and Angola where he will highlight his mother Princess Diana's landmine campaign. 
At least seven children are reported to have died after a classroom collapsed at a primary school in Kenya. The accident happened at the Precious Talent Academy this morning in the capital, Nairobi. Dozens more people are said to be injured. Government officials have opened an investigation into the cause of the accident. Now, if you're looking to go green with an electric car, there's a variety of incentives on offer, like interest-free loans and government grants. But one problem for green drivers is the issue of where to charge your vehicle. If you don't have off-street parking, doing it at home is impossible, and public charging points are few and far between. Unless you live in Dundee, that is. The City Council's just opened the first of three planned charging hubs on a car park roof, powered by solar panels. Here's our innovation correspondent, Laura Goodwin with the details. Electric vehicle chargers in Dundee regularly record some of the highest usage in Scotland, partly because at the moment anyone can charge their car for free and the city has been keen to pilot new EV infrastructure. As a result, many local businesses have moved to electric. Ryan Todd runs a taxi service. You know, if I could run a fleet of electric cars or a fleet of diesels, it would be electric all day long because there's just so little that goes wrong with them. Um, so Dundee's now got, I think at the last count, you're looking at about 140 electric taxis. We reckon the vans drive around 1,000 miles per week. We've actually, as a company, changed to a more environmental way of dry cleaning. We're, we've moved, made that change. It's not just the vehicles that we've made that change with. We are trying to lower our impact. But getting Dundee residents to choose electric has been harder. Half the housing in the city doesn't have access to a driveway. This electric vehicle car park is the first of its kind in the UK. It uses solar power and a storage system, which allows 20 cars to be charged at a time. The idea is that visitors can use it during the day and overnight, local residents could charge their cars. It's actually got 800 uh, kilowatt um, transformer here, so there's a lot of power here. The uh, reason for that is so we can start, as the increase in EVs, we can start quickly increasing the numbers here. We've got a lot of power. So what do you plan to do with the excess? Potentially uh, a coach uh, company, um, starting from here, a pure electric coach, and that would be the first in the UK. The uptake in electric vehicles has been so great that Dundee City Council is now going to start charging for charging, although local residents will still get it for free. We've had a honeymoon period, as long as it's, it's fairly priced, and at the end of the day, it's still going to be cheaper than filling up your, your car with petrol or, or diesel. Phase tariffs will be brought in from November, but it's hoped further incentives, like a trial of on-street pop-up chargers, will keep Dundee's electric vehicle converts hooked. Laura Goodwin, BBC News. You're watching the Monday night edition of The Nine. Now for a recap of tonight's top stories. More than 150,000 holidaymakers are to be repatriated after the travel company Thomas Cook collapsed. 22,000 people have lost their jobs. Greta Thunberg has made a passionate speech on climate change at the United Nations and she set eyes on President Donald Trump for the first time. And still to come before the end of the programme. We are in the US for the first in a series of reports looking ahead to key issues for 2020 presidential election voters. Tonight we look at the climate and coal debate in West Virginia. Now, this 16-year-old is becoming one of the best-known teenagers on the planet. And today, Greta Thunberg, the climate change activist, has launched a strongly worded attack on world leaders at the UN, accusing them of betraying her generation by failing to act on global warming. Many heads of state stayed away from the one-day UN climate summit in New York. American President Donald Trump hadn't been expected, but he was briefly spotted in the audience. Here's the BBC's North America correspondent, Nick Bryant. A sweltering September scorcher in New York City. Not much sign of autumn here. And it hasn't just been a long summer, but north of the equator, the hottest ever on record. So today at the Riverside headquarters of the United Nations, an urgent climate action summit. This global body once more sounding the alarm. The world is losing the race against climate change. 
in this air-conditioned auditorium, the heat came from the 16-year-old Swedish activist Greta Thunberg. The UN hoping to harness what's being called the Greta effect, her ability to mobilize the young and to shame the old. And my, how she did that today. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. For the grown-ups in the room, it was awkward. But they applauded nonetheless. Mr. President, the, the world's United most powerful adult only briefly stopped by. Greta Thunberg watched from the side, scowling as he arrived. He didn't address the summit himself. He's withdrawing America from the Paris Climate Change Accord. And he took the chair of a rival event organized by the White House at the UN on religious persecution. For once, Donald Trump was upstaged by a teenager with a furious speech that will echo down the generations. And that was Nick Bryant reporting. Right, let's stick with the USA and climate change. Donald Trump, of course, came to power promising to make America great again. He said he had a straightforward plan to get the economy moving. He would cut taxes and slash what he described as the red tape constricting business. Well, this week on The Nine, we'll have a series of special reports from around the states looking at President Trump's first term in office and assessing his chances of re-election next year. Our chief news correspondent, James Cook, will hear about the economy in Pennsylvania and he'll visit Texas to examine immigration at the US border with Mexico, two of the hottest issues ahead of the election. But first to West Virginia, where the interests of the coal industry have collided with concerns about climate change. Well, James is there for us now. James. Yes, well, this is really very, very strongly red territory. That is to say, an area which has rock-solid support in many respects for the President of the United States, Donald Trump, West Virginia. And one of the reasons for that is fossil fuels and his prioritization of getting rid of regulations, allowing coal miners, in his opinion, to go back to work. On the other side of that, though, even here in West Virginia, those messages we were hearing there from New York, from the climate change discussions at the United Nations are filtering through and they're beginning to have an impact, setting up, even in this state, an interesting clash. It was the day the UK voted to leave the European Union. But nobody cared about that in White Sulphur Springs. They were fighting to survive, engulfed by flood and fire as gas lines exploded. This is a burning house floating through the middle of town. Dad, watch out! By the time it was all over, 23 people were dead. Three years on, the creek is silent. The houses which still stand on its banks are abandoned now, but the wreckage and the horror remain. This is the tree That's where your, your wife was. That's the tree that my wife was in. Ronnie Scott's wife, Belinda, was found clinging to the branches, badly burned. She'd been trapped inside the attic of their home. But as Ronnie scrambled down the hill to try to save her, the house exploded. <laughs> I'm flip-flopping down, and I got stopped right along the edge of the water, in mud. I was praying to God. So we got about 30 yards, and Blinda done told me the house had natural gas in it. And about 30 yards, I heard a kaboom, and I lost it again. As you know, my wife ended up on, at the burn center, and I finally get to go down there on, on the 
Saturday and hey it it was really nasty. I was I ended up in the floor crying. Um, so we're headed up to a couple of our research plots where we've induced an artificial drought experiment. In the lush yeah, forests of West Virginia, uh, Professor like. Nicholas Zegg is tracking the links between climate and storms. The glade is bristling with his technology. And here we have what we call sap flux sensors, and this allows us to measure how much water trees are using in real time. Um, Even the trees here, here have tales to tell, like and their story are, uh, is this, longer droughts and more intense storms driven by climate change. They seem to be occurring more frequently and, uh, and the magnitude or the size of those storms appear to be greater. So the critical thing to understand is that the entire system as a whole is becoming more variable. And we saw that most notably, I think in 2016 with those catastrophic floods. Yes, um, the uh, 2016 flood in the Greenbrier Valley was absolutely catastrophic. And incidentally, we've had very large storms, um, floods almost every year since 2016 as well. Are you certain that human behavior, human activity is to blame for this? It's really critical to understand with the amount of people we have on this planet, it is impossible to not have an impact on the earth and an impact on the atmosphere. Is there a lot of skepticism about the science behind climate change? Um, so I wouldn't say a skepticism um, is apparent. Full on denial certainly is apparent that it is not happening, that it climate change has always happened. Um, but what I can say, oh, increasingly over the years, I've seen a greater willingness to talk about climate change. These students may be evidence of that. They've spent the weekend protesting outside their university in Morgantown. Even in coal-rich West Virginia, the young are campaigning for action on climate change. So just like we have acid in here, we're increasing the acid level in this vial right here. Olivia Young, who is studying astrophysics, works on a project funded by NASA visiting schools to demonstrate climate science. Most of the time I talk to little kids and so sometimes I will get questions like, oh, but my mommy or daddy said this. Um, I, I don't try to step on parents' toes. I try really hard not to do that. Um, with the older students, we do try to engage more in um, active conversations. And just things like this demonstration, it's very simple um, to be able to show the science. And that's what we focus on. We focus on showing the science, the scientific process, that this is why we're thinking the way we are. We didn't just you know, come up with an idea. We actually have evidence to back it up. Nothing else matters if you don't have a planet to live on, right? And so in my mind, it's absolutely the most important issue that we have. I think it's specifically important in West Virginia because uh, most of what we have to offer is our landscape and the mountains and the trees and so it's really discouraging when we hear people from West Virginia proposing mountaintop removal or cutting down our trees and like if you take that we don't have much left. Still, polls suggest just four in ten West Virginians think global warming is mostly driven by human activity and some coal miners are scornful of these environmentalists. When you see these people out in the streets, what do you think? The first thing I do is question their sanity. If they turn off the televisions, put their phones down, quit driving their cars, quit buying carpet, and quit building houses. You wanna go live in a cave, that'll solve the problem because nobody will make anything. To have folks that are living comfortably, you have to have consistent, reliable electric power. That doesn't come from wind, windmills, doesn't come from solar panels, doesn't come from pixie dust, doesn't come from unicorns, and doesn't come from well wishes. That comes from fossil fuel. President Trump has cast himself as the defender of fossil fuel, rolling back his predecessor's environmental regulations to the industry's delight. What do coal miners here in West Virginia, what do you think of the president? West Virginia came through a really difficult period during the Obama administration, where good, hardworking men and women lost their jobs for no other reason than for a short-sighted political agenda implemented by that administration. So President Trump has been a relief to us. He's been a breath of fresh air. We think he shares our values. There is not actually much evidence of a boom in coal under Mr. Trump. More than twice as many people are now employed harnessing wind power than digging carbon. And yet the fuel still has a powerful pull. Coal runs through this state in more ways than one. 
For many West Virginians, for many years, it's put bread on the table, but it's also been part and parcel of their family identity. Even here though, deep in coal country, that may now be changing. I always, always walk over. And for Ronnie, the issue is now deeply personal. Hey, I hug that tree and I kiss it. And this spot right here is the only place you can come. I'm gonna be with Blenda again. You know, I'm gonna be with Blenda, be with my mom, my dad. Hey, and you know, and I hope when we, when we meet, we don't have to worry about floods, fires, all the bad stuff that goes on in this world. You're all right. <laughs> I'm gonna thank y'all. Thank you. Hey. And then I want to know what we're going to do about this global warming. And oh, that's the big question everyone's well, talking know, about, isn't it's, it? It's, I know it's, it's terrible, but like I said, people need to change the way of living. It is a powerful plea. James Cook, BBC News in West Virginia. A powerful plea indeed, James. And that is the picture in West Virginia. And we've seen climate change become a really big issue across the Western world and beyond, especially over the last few months. But just how big an issue will it be for everyday Americans come next year's presidential race? Well, I think it's going to be a significant issue, not least because the Democrats are making it a campaign issue. And they're just at the moment trying to finesse what they want to do with that campaign. I mean, it'll depend on who the candidate here is, of course, in the United States, who runs against Donald Trump. But look, all these vehicles going up and down here give you something of a clue as to why climate change is such a big issue. Americans love their cars. Having said that, there are changes afoot. We heard there about this uh, suggestion that Donald Trump's been great for the coal industry. But in fact, coal production fell last year, and there's some people who don't have cars, you don't see that very often, especially in this weather. Coal production actually fell last year, and it's down again this year. Uh, coal consumption is falling in the United States too. So there are a couple of reasons why uh, that's, the debate's perhaps more complex than it seems. And also one other thing that's really important to bear in mind, the, the share of Americans who think that climate change is a major threat to their well-being is up from 40% in 2013 to 57% this year. And that shows that at least some of the electorate, I mean, it is split on party lines, but at least quite a lot of the electorate think this is a big issue. Indeed. And James, you've got a busy week ahead of you. Just tell us, where's next for you and, and what's the next issue you're going to be looking at for us? Well, so obviously the economy, the environment uh, coming together and coal are a big story, but we're going to look in, uh, in the wider sense at the economy next. And we're going to be traveling to Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania to hear from voters there. It's interesting because Pennsylvania last time was one of three states which were crucial to the election of Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton actually won the overall vote in the United States, but because of the way the system works, it came down to three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. If 80,000 votes in this country had gone the other way in those three states, Hillary Clinton would be president. So we're going to check in with some people there. We're going to check in with a, a farmer as well and talk about the impact of the trade war. And then we're heading down to the Mexican border in Texas to hear about the other hot button issue in American politics, another one that Donald Trump has prioritized, immigration. Okay, great, James. We will look forward to hearing from the people you speak to. Thanks very much. Well, from the Midwest to the Far East, I fear there was bad news for Scotland there, wasn't there, Amy? Oh, there really was. Yes, Martin, good evening. The Scotland rugby captain says the squad are searching for answers after a demoralising opening game defeat in the World Cup. Stuart McAnally admits the match against Ireland and Yokohama is one they must learn from if they're to stand any chance of progression. Today, the squad moved on to their second destination, where they'll face Samoa next week. From Kobe, here's our sports news correspondent, Chris McLaughlin. Defeat last night, today the train. On to Kobe and hoping to forget Yokohama. 
Now the team are further back on the train, they have a couple of carriages to themselves, but they would be well advised to stay away from the English language local newspaper, the Japan Times, talking about Ireland steamrolling them in Yokohama last night. The big question for the Scotland squad is how do they recover on the way to Kobe? The city lies 300 miles south of Tokyo. Scotland will now be here for around 10 days, trying desperately to get game one out of their system. Psychologically, how difficult or otherwise is it to shrug something like that off? Yeah, look, it's, at, at the moment it's, it's tough because you've, you invest a lot of time into a game. You know, we've invested a lot of time into that Allen game and that goes for everyone involved in this group. And, um, and to, to perform so poorly it was it's really disheartening. Murray switches, there's loads of space. It was another slow start for Scotland, something that's becoming a recurring theme. And is that the one that means it's just way out of sight? I think they're in a bad place at the moment. Uh, Stuart McNally has just done a press conference. He looked really dejected. 24 hours later, he's really, really hurting. I think they all are hurting. I think they're all confused. I think they're all angry, and I'm not sure too many of them have the solutions. So Scotland find themselves in exactly the position they didn't want to be in at this stage of the competition. Defeat against Ireland could have been predicted, but it's the manner of that defeat that's drawing the criticism. They now have a week here in Kobe to try and deal with that before going again against Samoa in a match that now seems crucial. Chris McLaughlin, BBC News in Kobe. Well, meanwhile, it was a terrific start for Wales as they opened their World Cup campaign with a bonus point six try win over Georgia in Toyota City earlier today. Tries from Jonathan Davis, Justin Tapurik, Josh Adams and Liam Williams secured the bonus point before half time with Thomas Williams and George North adding in the second half. It was the oldest Wales starting side at a Rugby World Cup with an average age of 28 years and 331 days. Australia now await Warren Gatlin's men in what will be a potential Pool D decider. We've had some really tight games over the years against uh, Australia, so look, we've got to go into the game with a lot of confidence. And we know as a team that we tend to, to get better as tournaments go on and, and we build on confidence. And so pleasing with the start today, and, and but there is a lot of room for us to, to improve for, ne for next week and a few things to tidy up on. Well, in football, and Ian McCall has become Partick Thistle manager for the second time after leaving championship rivals Air United. The 54-year-old switches from the side sick, sitting second bottom on goal difference to the one at the bottom of the table. Another former Thistle manager, Alan Archibald, returns to Fir Hill as McCall's assistant, along with former Air midfielder Neil Scally. Russian officials handed over data which contained inconsistencies to World Anti-Doping Agency chiefs, the body set up to combat drug cheating in sport has said. WADA suspects data may have been manipulated before being passed on. The BBC understands the discovery of these inconsistencies in the data and the suggestion it had been tampered with could lead to renewed pressure on the International Olympic Committee to ban Russia from next year's Tokyo Games. Clearly, it's incredibly concerning and incredibly disappointing. Um, I'm not sure that if you speak to a number of people in the sporting movement, they'll necessarily exp express a huge amount of shock, to be honest with you. Um, this is data that should have been made available right from the off. It wasn't. Um, a number of obstacles were placed to avoid that data being obtained and then when it's finally obtained and you're rooting through it and assessing it and assimilating it you suddenly find that it doesn't all quite tally uh, I think it's incredibly concerning with the World Championships getting underway later this week, the IAAF President Lord Coe says he'd like to see Castor Semenya return to athletics, but within the regulations. The 800 metre world champion won't be defending her title in Doha because she refuses to comply with the new rules governing testosterone levels in female athletes. But speaking to the BBC's Alex Capstick, Coe says that he hopes she hasn't given up track and field forever. We haven't set those regulations to exclude people. They are actually there to allow us to maintain the presence 
of those athletes with that condition mm. at international level. So you'd like to see it back in 800 metres or 5,000 metres, yes, not, ta not within, taking them. within those regulations, of course. Well, just before I go, at the best FIFA football awards tonight, Lionel Messi has won the best men's player award, while Megan Rapinoe wins best female player, beating fellow American Alex Morgan to that award. No surprises so, in yes. either of those. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Amy. Now, one of the television industry's biggest nights has taken place in LA less than 24 hours ago. The Emmy Awards recognised the best in TV from the past year and it was a big night for shows from here in the UK. Our entertainment reporter David Farrell is here to tell us more and it seems Americans have got a, a lot of love for Phoebe Waller-Bridge, don't they? Yep, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, definitely the most famous bridge in the world at the moment. <laughs> Everyone is certainly talking about her after uh, last night and um, she is the star and creator of the BBC comedy Fleabag. She also gave us Killing Eve, but last night picking up four awards, um, wow. comedy series for Fleabag, uh, writing, directing, and also a uh, lead actress in a comedy uh, for Fleabag as well. So a, a good night uh, out in LA last night. Indeed. So, some people might be surprised that the Americans love her so much. I mean, what, what do you think it is about her that they're, they're buying into? Well, I think that, I, I think she's one of those big British exports just now in the world of, of entertainment. Um, Fleabag uh, in the second series in the States gathered a lot of word of mouth, a lot of fans in the States, um, just gripped by certainly by series two. Um, and what she's created is two completely different shows mm. in Fleabag, a programme about um, one woman who's going to find her way through relationships and everything else. She encounters in our life, Killing Eve, which is about an assassin and an MI5 agent. So two completely different uh, stories altogether. And I think it's just she's the she can do so many uh, amazing things with whatever she touches. And of course, yeah. writing for Bond 25 as well. Um, and she actually, when she was on stage collecting one of her many awards last night, she did say uh, when she accepted one of them, she felt pretty lucky to be there. And uh, yeah, it's just really wonderful that uh, to know and reassuring that a um, dirty, pervy, angry, uh, messed up woman can make it to the Emmys. So uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. How does a British show even get nominated for the Emmys? It's not just for American telly. Well, that's what you think, but now in the world of streaming, it crosses over so many boundaries. Ah. So Killing Eve, although it airs here in the UK, is actually a BBC America programme, which airs in the States, first of all. So that's why Killing Eve can be included. Uh, and Fleabag Season 2 was a, uh, was a co-production with Amazon. So that streams uh, in the US as well. So that technically is part of an American uh, production as well. So that's why both of them are in there. And we can claim Fleabag as our own, can we? We certainly can. I think this is the best news from last <laughs> night because uh, Fleabag Day Debuted as a, a one-woman stand-up show at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2014. Oh, we're having that. Uh, that's oh, yeah. ours. So Fleabag is ours. We're putting the stamp <laughs> right on that. The salt tire is all across that. And uh, now picking up Emmys. And uh, also next weekend, uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge will be co-hosting Saturday Night Live in the States with Taylor Swift. So, oh, she really has hit yeah, the big time. It just gets bigger and bigger for her. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there was. A, she wasn't the only Killing Eve kind of um, contributor. Jodie Comer, well. yeah, big night for her. Um, she's 26. She's already won a TV BAFTA for uh, this role um, earlier on this year. This is her first Emmy nomination, and that turned into her first Emmy win, which is a uh, which is a bit of a success story as well. Um, and she picked up um, the uh, actress category uh, in a tough category with Viola Davis from How to Get Away with Murder, Sandra O oh from Killing Eve as well. Um, but one thing that Jodie Comer really wished last night was that her mum and dad were there Aww. and they were in Liverpool and uh, she regretted not bringing them to LA last night. Jodie Comer. <laughs> and um, my mum and dad were in Liverpool who I didn't invite because I didn't think this was going to be my time. <laughs> One, I'm sorry. Two, I love you. I'm going to bring it home. Thank you very much.
What's well, the I opposite of complacency? <laughs> 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 Assuming you're going to lose. Yeah, doing your mum and dad. Yeah. I love listening to her speaking in a yeah. lovely accent because anyone that watches Killing Eve, I mean, she's the queen of accents, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, she could do so. And you just have to search for the different gifts and memes yeah. on the internet with her accents. But yeah, she's a, she's a star. Big things yeah. for her. And very, very briefly, Game of Thrones did well as well, right? Yep, so Game of Thrones walked away with uh, 12 nominations last night. Uh, sorry, 12 awards last night. Best drama series, wow. the big one of the night, which a lot of people were surprised at actually because the final season had mixed reactions to how that that ended so yeah it took the big award of the night breaking its own record from 2015 of basically going home with the most awards for one show in one night very so impressive. that game of thrones mantelpiece will be very heavy yes with all those indeed awards. good stuff good. thank good you very much thanks, thanks david now, what's the most daring thing you've done lately? Well, one adventurous mountaineer says he's lucky to be alive after a base jump gone wrong in the Highlands. Sam Percival somehow escaped with only minor injuries after his parachute was caught by a gust of wind, smashing him into a rock face. Ian McInnes has more. Right, I think I'm good, guys. Over 3,000 feet up, preparing to do something no one's done before. Jumping! A base jump from Inchaloch Ridge in Wester Ross was just thinking this is really beautiful. You know, it's a really beautiful area. Just for that split second, for that moment, you're disconnected. You, you're not in touch with the mountain. You're not in touch with the earth. And the next thing was just a huge um, centrifugal spin. You know, uh, something just threw me sideways and then I'm presented with the cliff. So have you looked at this equipment yet? Or is no, this is... But he's here to recount the tale. Walking wounded, you could say. Suffering with only minor scapes and bruises given me something. And the helmet itself isn't too badly done. Yeah. Today, the first chance to survey his damaged kit and reflect on what was a miraculous escape. And when I slid off that ledge and slid backwards, I thought, OK, this it's really gone wrong now. You know, um, it's, it's really going to hurt. I really feel from this point on, I, I, I just rolled sixes. You know, everything from that point on was, was pure luck and it, and it worked in my favour. For all those watching, saying people doing sports like this must be mad, there is a note of caution from experts. I think it's all too easy to jump to conclusions that people are perhaps unprepared or, you know, it's not a bungee jump we're talking about here. I've got no doubt in my mind that the base jumping community is a very expert community. Has it put you off? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, Has it put your girlfriend off? It's put the girlfriend off, yeah. Um, certainly, you know, that day, I looked at the rig in, in tatters on the floor and I thought, I'm just going to leave that there. So I guess time will tell. Sam's a lucky boy, but it seems the call of adventure may well still draw him back. Lucky boy indeed, eh? Uh, yeah, oh, yes. exactly. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not his mammy put it that way. <laughs> it's nice weather for base jumping by the look of it. Yeah, but well, yeah, it wasn't too bad. It certainly was last week. But all changed this week. That glorious high pressure that brought the generous warm weather and the sunshine. Uh, that uh, seems like a distant memory now. Mistiness this morning. It is the season of mist and mellow fruitfulness after all. A beautiful sunset, though, there in Edinburgh earlier on. But certainly a big change as low pressure takes over, driving our weather over the coming week. Weather front after weather front, bringing outbreaks of rain, uh, but also some drier interludes. So it's not all doom and gloom by any stretch of the imagination. But we do have some heavy rain across southern Scotland, making its way across the country as we head through the overnight period. It's showery. There'll be some heavy bursts, maybe the odd rumble of thunder, and fairly misty and murky for parts of the east coast and into the Northern Isles, particularly so for Shetland, but largely dry in the far north and temperature which is not falling too much actually, around about 12 to 14 Celsius, so very mild. So that's how tomorrow starts. It'll be rather overcast with those outbreaks of showery rain, some heavy bursts within it for the rush hour. But the rain does tend to ease as we head through the course of the day and winds will be light. So again, we'll hold on to murkiness towards the eastern coastal areas and that rain being reinvigorating across the south later on. I think Shetland will continue to see a feed of mist and low cloud, maybe the odd spot of drizzle. We might see a wee bit of brightness for Orkney, but fairly murky towards the Aberdeenshire coast, brightening up around Inverness though, but that rain coming back to parts of 
eastern Scotland in towards Fife, the southeast, brightening up for the southwest corner and some of the Inner Hebrides as well. But the best of any sunshine will be found across the Western Isles and the northwest. Temperature wise, not looking too bad either. So, in two tomorrow evenings, some really quite heavy rain for central Scotland and parts of the east. It tends to ease as we head through the overnight period. Then we're left with a legacy of cloud. That's how Wednesday starts. Cloudy, misty, some bits and pieces of rain, but it does promise to brighten up. We'll see the odd share passing through, but we should see pretty good spells of sunshine by the end of the day and mainly light winds with highs of around about 18 degrees. That's your forecast. Not too bad. Thank you very much, Judith. Thanks, Judith. Well, that's it from us tonight. We'll be back at the same time, same place tomorrow. From Rebecca and me, thank you very much indeed for watching and enjoy what's left of your evening. Good night.